MindFoundry was, was started by Professor Steve Roberts and Professor Mike Osborne uh, from the Machine Learning Research Group at the University of Oxford. And it was spun out in order to create AI for high stakes applications where mm. decisions would affect people's lives or would be made at the scale of populations in a way that made them a safety critical application. You couldn't, you couldn't do just off the shelf AI where all too often were seduced by the speed and performance mm. of AI without knowing what's the fundamental method of action, like what's going on under the hood. You actually had to do AI differently. You had to approach it like a safety critical system and mm. you had to develop specific methods that would give you insight into how it operated, how a decision was made and what, what the potential for failures would be so that whether the environment was regulated or had specific governance requirements that you could understand what the impact would be on people's lives. And when I, when I heard that, that two professors who were uh, famous for their work academically in, in machine learning who were looking for a, a CEO to scale that business, um, it took me about 30 seconds to want to be a part of it. When I met them, they're, they're super humble. You know, even if you're not super close to AI as an industry, most people have read the Economist's Future of Work series um, mm -hmm. about how AI will take work or, or transform the workplace, which is based on, on Professor Osborne's uh, work that he did. You know, Professor Roberts has been a professor for about 30 years and has, I think, over 100,000 citations. A just amazing, amazing man. And uh, it's a pleasure mm -hmm. to work with both of them and the team that they've created. Yeah. What well, are there particular kinds of, well, maybe for those in our audience who are not too familiar with AI, I mean, you know, everyone's heard of ChatGPT probably by now, but tell us a bit about specifically how the systems you're working with operate and what, what exactly are you, are you doing and, and what particular problems are you solving? Um, yeah, I, I think that's an important set of questions people should ask about AI more broadly. I think we're very comfortable with people calling the industry AI, right? It's a mm. super category. Everything in it is, is artificial intelligence, but it's really made up of a lot of things, mm. you know, and technically most of those things are probably best characterized as, as machine learning, even mm. in the examples that you mentioned. And you know, what, what AI is, is probably a, a topic of great debate, but within the methods that, you know, are available in AI, some are much more understandable than others. And some allow you to do things more quickly, but at the cost of understanding. There's always a balance in, okay, how do we innovate? And then how do we make it robust for use in the real world? Mm -hmm. And there's a tension between those things, but I don't think that there's a conflict between them. And we don't think, we don't think there is either. And so we work across the spectrum of technologies where innovation needs to occur, but uh, we have a greater level of requirement in understanding throughout the pipeline of an AI or machine learning application. So what what does the data represent and how is it collected? You know, what are the model types that are most appropriate when that's the case? What are they capable of? And then more importantly, as you get to the other side of the pipeline, what decisions are going to be made based upon the recommendations of the system? what interventions might be taken and what are the direction of those interventions and how can we combine those things together in a way that limits risks, allows the automated systems to do what they do best, but allows, allows the people and actually, you know, relies on collaborating with people in a way that make both together able to accomplish more than they would be able to alone, which is pretty, pretty powerful. And we've seen that with all kinds of AI applications, you know, I think one of the early examples that still is, is, you know, evolving to this day is how chess is played mm. in a world with mm -hmm. AI. And now if we're all honest, I think very simple chess programs beat most of us. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. so the day that AI beat a grandmaster, you know, I mean, it seems like a lot, but, but it was already, you know, basic computer programs were better, mm. better than most of us. You know, a lot of people predicted from that the death of playing chess or, or certainly the, the sport of um, professional chess. And it just wasn't the case. Not only does it, does it still go on, there's also uh, hybrid chess where you can team up with an AI mm -hmm. or you can play alone or you can have an AI play alone and, and right. people do in all those configurations. And I think we're currently in a, in a period where AI only teams 
are winning most of the time. But for most of the time since AI came around, actually human and AI teaming teams together were much more, more powerful. There's these, you know, kind of unexpected dimensions where, okay, the AI is powerful, can be a grandmaster, but then it turns out you could take a, a high school level player and put them together with an AI and they could outperform any grandmaster in the world. And it's because you could leverage the strengths of both. And then there was a, there's a great anecdote, I think from the last five or 10 years where a couple of, of guys were playing who were not chess players at all. And they weren't AI players either. They just had this crazy theory that if they made some moves every once in a while that were unexpected, then the AI could do what it did, that the opposition could never really kind of get a lock on what they were doing. And they were right. They, they won the championship, you know, m- multiple yeah. years for the, for the hybrid competition. And, you know, so it just really, really shows that as the, the technology is evolving, we don't really understand the implication. We don't know what's going to replace humans entirely and, and what is going to benefit from, from the collaboration together. I will go on record with saying the idea that we're close to a super intelligence emerging from, from the technology and, and it kind of superstitiously becoming self-aware feels very superstitious from, from where we sit. There's nothing in the method of, of operation of these systems that is persistent beyond a single request where consciousness could emerge e- even if we thought that the mechanisms and the models at all were capable of doing so. The complexity that's represented in, in these systems, while impressive from an application standpoint, doesn't even approach the complexity that's found in, in you know, what is necessary for human consciousness. And I think, I think we really need to temper expectations. It's exciting to see and sometimes it's scary, an AI do things that only humans had previously done. But it's also a little bit of a gimmick. I think one you know kind of clear illustration of that is the architectures that are breaking new ground today. These kind of transformer-based architectures that are doing cool things with text that kind of scares us and makes us think you know is it self-aware are not not totally dissimilar to the same type of generative architectures for images. Mm-hmm. Right. But when we see an image generator make a picture, especially if it's got, you know, 20 fingers, <laughs> right, right. none of us are afraid that that model's <laughs> even remotely close to being self-aware and is going to take over the planet. For some reason, when we put text in it, it scares mm-hmm. us. And I think it's because it's, you know, that's something that's been uniquely human. We haven't gone through the uncanny valley of looking at graphics and computer-based images and and, and, and kind of gotten used to the, the synthetic nature of images and video. That's not to say that it's not powerful. It's not to say that there's not risks in, in how you apply it and, and where you use it and the risk that will occur economically and, and how things are transformed. But my personal hard stance is that we're nowhere near super intelligence. And, um, you know, if that's something that you're afraid of, don't worry about it. If it's something that you're really looking forward to, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, I want to ask you, let's, let's, let's talk a bit about that, because there, there are people who I think find it part of what the, the, the beauty is they find in, in AI is, is the kind of seductions of, of this idea of you singularity know, or, 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 or being able to somehow transcend our humanity, right? And then you have, you have post-humanism and transhumanism and various other kinds of uh, ideologies that I think are seeing in AI the potential to transcend all of our human limitations and in technology more generally, like whether it's the ability to, to live forever or the kind of ability to have some kind of super intelligence that, that can mitigate all of the challenges that we face, whether or not that, that intelligence would turn against us is a different story. But what assumptions about intelligence are being made there do you see? And why, you know, why, why do you think we can't get there, or at least that it's not within any kind of immediate scope in, in terms of uh, arriving at that kind of a future? Yeah, so I think... That's the question of our day. You would have to first define what's intelligence. Yeah. Right. If you're trying to make artificial intelligence, what is intelligence? Mm. You know, one of the common metaphors is do submarines swim? Mm. No, but they're very good at going through the water, which is what you want a submarine to do. Mm. And that's the era that we're at with AI and machine learning. Like what they're doing is very good at going through the water, but it's, it's not swimming as a fish is, it's not experiencing what a fish is experiencing. And I think if you, if you look at just the, the complexity of, of the human brain and, and the entire organic system around it, and just from an information 
standpoint, the, the complexity of every cell in our body that's contributing to the conversations and the motivations and what's going on to underpin that conscious experience, it is significantly greater than anything we've been able to abstract into a computer. If you just do basic back of the napkin math, the entire corpus of all written documents that would be used to train a large language model is less information than the average four-year-old child would see with their eyes throughout their life, right? Mm. And so just from a, a magnitude of training data in order to get, you know, if you believed that, that the human experience was purely a brute force neural network, that all I needed was enough data to make sense of the world, we're nowhere near the complexity that the average human does at the age of four, yeah. right? And, and yes, if it's in written text form, there's more text than any one human could experience in their life. But sure. there's a lot more to understanding you know, the world and the human condition than just the text documents. Even in that brute force configuration, you need to live as a human in human environments. Even to make that form of a brute force learned human consciousness viable from an information and commute, compute standpoint, I don't think it adds up. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to make really powerful machines that do awesome stuff. And there are risks associated with them as much as there are opportunities. Like that's, that's not what that means. It's just, it's just when you go one step further and you say, oh man, the next version on the current trajectory of development on this curve could be the singularity. It doesn't seem like that's actually realistic. Are we on an amazing hockey stick up curve in technology and innovation? Yes, but that curve is defined by an equation that if I zoom in or zoom out, the curve looks the same no matter where you're at on it. <laughs> and, and so whether you realize in the macro or the micro, yes, things are changing quickly. It doesn't mean that there's still not a lot of development that is still far away from the point that we're at. And that that is where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about the work you all have done at Mind Foundry and and what do you find beautiful about it? Where do you where do you encounter beauty in the, in the work that you're doing? To talk about AI, we'd have to define what what intelligence is. What is beauty? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an important question. I mean, if you think about it, there's a, a, a framework. I'm not even sure the first time I heard it, and I'm not going to be able to attribute it correctly. I'll just say it's it's not mine, but it makes sense. And that is that there are kind of three natures of beauty. There's the first, which is the aesthetic beauty that you would expect when you think mm -hmm. about beauty, kind of maybe intuitively in the English language, perfect proportions, perfect representation of, of function and form, beautiful person, beautiful piece of art. But then there's a kind of second nature, which is the beauty of of simplicity. And this is where you have this elegant mathematical equation that describes some fundamental force, and it's beautiful because how simple it is. But the problem with this type of beauty is that sometimes it's a mirage. Right. Sometimes the simplicity is beautiful, but the world has complexity in it. Yeah. And that leads and to the third type of beauty, which is the beauty of true understanding, like understanding mm. the truth of the universe. Brian, that's our study. <laughs> that's our study. Your study. <laughs> yeah. That's the it's, work we did on scientists, and that's that's what we found. So yeah, those three types were. Oh, is that is it directly yeah, from your yeah, study? That, oh, yeah, right. yeah, so yeah, so yeah. so you, you can source it for me back. That's, that's funny. Uh, apparently, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you did such a good job uh, that somebody's told me the story and that's hilarious. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. was not able to attribute it back, and I was explaining it to you. So hopefully, I did a good that's job great. of explaining it. Yeah, I, that's, uh, what, that's exactly what we found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I. I really found it to be uh, a useful framework for me to, to kind of understand the stages. And what, mm. what I see in our work is actually beauty in, of each of the kind, uh, you know, mm. each, each of those kinds. Sometimes it's related to the problem that's solved. I think that's very aesthetic. It's kind of the beauty of a moral action. Like when you solve a problem and you're doing the right thing or making life better for someone, like it's very beautiful. I think the the second one, the simplicity is the risk, especially when we're innovating. We've done some some just amazing innovation. I'm just blown away every day by the team that I work with and, and the things that we come up with. And I think simplicity is sometimes a mirage. Sometimes it's a good 
direction finder, we've got this concept that we talk about a lot at MindFoundry, which is simplexity, mm, <laughs> which is wow. where, you know, we live in a com complex world and, and complexity has emergence and it has all of these characteristics that lead to what people might refer to as, you know, things that are like chaotic or that have emergent properties. Simplicity isn't always enough to define those things, but this some idea of simplexity is, you know, can I see what is constraining them as the complexity is emerging in the mm -hmm. system? And that that's a very good direction finder for a greater level of understanding. And then finally, I think, you know, one of the things I, I like a lot about the team I work with is the willingness to learn new things that challenge, you know, what we accepted as true before. And the beauty of understanding is mm -hmm. sometimes you understand that you've been working for a long time under a bad set of assumptions and yeah. that you have to change them or, or you won't be able to move forward anymore. And that's not a loss. Yeah, that's, that's not a mistake. That's, that's, that's a win. That's, yeah. oh, we got understanding. It's like, this is, this is what it's all about is, is actually getting that deeper level of understanding and that we only lose when we stop trying to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, an experience or a moment that comes to mind where, where you, you could recognize this kind of beauty, you know, maybe, maybe in, maybe in, in an accomplishment that you're especially proud of at, at Mind Foundry? One of the stories I like to tell is a collaboration that our founders and, and some of our team members were a part of with the university, with a larger group that was exploring how AI and machine learning could be applied to interventions in mosquitoes in the developing world, specifically with regards to malaria. Mm -hmm. And it's just a really inspiring project. Again, it was something that we collaborated on with a lot of brilliant people from foundations, from the university, and we were just honored to be a part of, but it was to listen to mosquitoes with a cell phone and tell if they're carrying the malaria parasite, right? So it was at the yeah. cutting edge of modeling specifically with regards to sensors, which is, which is an area that, that MindFoundry focuses on, but applied in something that just had, you know, sweeping implications. It's really beautiful to see, you know, what is the, the most cutting edge technology that's normally like, like it or not associated with things like mobile apps and games and, mm. and, and ad tech applied to a real human problem that's systemic and, and has been, you know, plaguing humanity quite literally since human had, humans had civilization. You know, yeah. if, if people knew the history of malaria and, and how many parts of the world that you couldn't live in, that you can live in now, you know, it's definitely still a part of our story to see new technology applied to interventions in the real world with AI. It's, it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, it's absolutely, I think, a growing problem, right? I mean, what we hear with climate change and the implications of that for the spread of mosquitoes and so on, it becomes really critical. Yeah. There's also a really interesting piece of understanding in that project that stood out for me. It actually honestly blew my mind. The models are able to listen to the sound of the mosquitoes and tell you what species of mosquito it is, you know, what gender of mosquito it is, and then whether or not the wing pattern is laden with parasites, which is pretty amazing. But the profound thing was we actually found that amongst the volunteers, some people could do it. Oh, and that wow. was amazing. And so, wow. so oftentimes these models are picking up on signals and things in the training data. And when you let them work with people, even though there's uncertainty about whether a person is capable of that, if a label that they made was right or not. But then when the models are able to make predictions, they're also able to tell you, hey, it turns out that this expert here gets it right all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's this, this kind of underlying you know, discovery about what humans are capable of in the process. Mm. And I, I mm. love that part of the story as well. Beauty at Work is brought to you by Templeton Religion Trust. If you enjoyed this clip, go check out the full episode. And please take a moment to subscribe and leave us a review. It really helps get the word out about the show. Thanks and see you next time.